But in 2019, according to a massive survey of the American people, 61% of adults reported themselves as being lonely. 61%. Loneliness is associated with a significant increase in death from any cause, all cause mortality. It's associated with a 50% increase in the risk of dementia. It's associated with a 32% increase in the risk of stroke. It's associated with a 29% increase in the risk of heart disease. Loneliness contributes to anxiety, depression, and suicide. And do you know what God's plan to address loneliness is? The church. The church. We are God's plan to address loneliness. And I think we all know that it has not gotten better in the last two years. It's gotten far worse. People now no longer feel isolated, but are isolated. People no longer think that they don't have any friends. Now they know they don't have any friends. Because they've been by themselves and nobody's been calling them and nobody's been reaching out to them for two years. Nobody's even been sitting beside them at work for two years. Turn with me, if you will, to Acts chapter 2. Thankfully and righteously so, the churches of Christ are the loud proponents of Acts chapter 2, right? We stand on the founding of the church and the Holy Spirit coming and bringing all of the truth to the apostles beginning in Acts chapter 2. And we know that the beginning of the church and the pattern by which the church should be founded and built and operated and organized begins in Acts chapter 2. And you know what happens there. The Holy Spirit descends on the apostles in power and there's tongues that look like fire. It's visible. There's a sound of rushing wind. It's audible. People can physically experience this presence of the Holy Spirit, and these men speak out, and people hear it in all different languages. And 3,000 souls are added to the church. Let's begin reading in verse 42. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. I believe that we have done a good job as a brotherhood of emphasizing the apostles' teaching. I believe we have done the right thing in emphasizing the breaking of bread and prayer. I think we have fallen short on fellowship. I think we have missed a part of the pattern which includes fellowship that is emphasized just as strongly as the apostles' teaching and breaking of bread in prayer in Acts chapter 2 and 3 and 4 and through the rest of the New Testament. I remember... When I was a young man, I graduated law school. My wife and I moved to Chattanooga, and we didn't know hardly anybody in Chattanooga. We started going around and visiting different congregations of the church, and my wife was working at a hospital. And 
every two or three weeks, she would have to work the weekends. And so she would be at work on Sunday morning and I would have to go to church by myself. And I have never lost my sympathy for people who come to church by themselves. It's one of the more difficult things that I have ever done in relation to the church. And I have talked to many widows and widowers after they lose a spouse. One of the most difficult things is the loneliness they feel when they sit in their seat in the worship assembly of the church. So my wife wasn't gone. She was just at work, but I would go to church. But I would try to sit in the back. I would try to avoid eye contact. I did not look for anybody to shake my hand. And I would try to make it to the closing prayer. But if I had a good opportunity to leave before the closing prayer, I might do it. Because I didn't understand the fellowship part. I didn't understand the relationship part. And now I see people doing exactly the same thing. I see people who time it so that they can get there during the first song and they leave during the last song. I see people who feel perfectly at ease leaving before the fellowship meal. They'll come out and they'll shake my hand. They'll tell me it was a good sermon. And then I'll say, I hope you'll stay and eat with us. No, we got, we're going to the restaurant. Because they don't think fellowship matters. They don't think it's as high a priority as the breaking of bread and prayer and apostles' teaching. And I think it hampers what we're supposed to be. So I want you to stop and let's go through this again a little bit more carefully. Just a couple of verses. Verse 42. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. Verse 44. All those who had believed were together. Do you realize the emphasis that the New Testament places on togetherness? Togetherness of the church is part of God's fundamental plan for saving souls. It makes souls grow stronger in spiritual faith, in the understanding of truth. It knits souls together and it knits people into a social fabric, which makes it much more difficult for them to stray away. And for people who are searching, for people who are alone, for people who feel unloved and discarded and cared about, and see if Jesus didn't talk to those people over and over and over. It gives them a place with a solution to all of those problems. Even Jesus, Mark chapter 3, verse 14, and he appointed 12, and what's the reason that's inspired? So that they would be with him. He appointed 12 so that they would be with him. The attitude that we don't need to be with other followers, that we don't need to be with brothers and sisters in Christ, is the opposite of Jesus' attitude. Jesus wanted people with him, and the idea that we shouldn't want people with us is mistaken. And this is what he prayed in John chapter 17, verse 20. I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but also for those who believe in me through their word. What? That they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us. And what will be the effect? That the world may believe that you sent me. There are a few things that tell non believers, unbelievers, non believers, few things that tell them they're right to not believe than one Christian talking about how much they dislike another Christian. One Christian telling a non-believer about the mistakes and the shortcomings and the uh, irritations of another Christian says, yep, I was right. Jesus ain't real. Jesus says, if you're one, Father, if you will help them to be one, the world will believe that you sent me. And it's a piece that we're missing, in my opinion, in my experience. And you see this in the New Testament church, verse Acts chapter 1, verse 14. These all with one mind were continually devoting themselves to prayer. With one mind, Acts chapter 2, verse 1. They were all together in one place. 
Acts chapter 4, verse 32, And the congregation of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and not one of them claimed that anything belonged to him was his own, but all things were common property to them. And so this is exactly what's taught in the epistles. This is fundamental to what it is to be the church, to be built on the pattern of the church. Philippians chapter 1, verse 27, Paul says, Whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, working together, 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 together. That is part of the pattern, part of the blueprint of what Jesus built in the church. And the idea that we can discard that, the idea that that's not important, that that's a lower level priority, it's not what Scripture teaches. It's not what Scripture teaches at all. The title of our lesson this morning is Obstacles to Fellowship. And so that was the first one. The first one is just a misunderstanding or a misapprehension of the importance of fellowship. I have suffered through it. I have suffered from it. And it's so interesting how when you become part of the effort of a congregation, when you start having responsibility when you become the person who has to get men to lead in the public worship or you start teaching a class or certain other things. You start caring how things go a lot more when you become personally invested. And that's certainly true of all different things. But another problem that we have with fellowship is people are proud not to need other people. I can do it on my own. I don't need him. He's useless to me. I can remember when I was a young youth minister and I started work at a congregation and they appointed one of the deacons to reorganize the family life groups. And, you know, a lot of different congregations have had the same thing. You might have um, different terms for them and their functions have certainly changed in the last 20 years. But the idea of you sort of break the congregation up into smaller groups and so you have them get together and and build relationships and engage in service projects and and um you know just try to maintain a fellowship by breaking it down into smaller numbers and also organize ministries and labors of the church and he came to me and he was very discouraged and we we were becoming friends and uh he just sort of poured his heart out to me and he said, I can't tell you who it is, but I've had three different people come to me and say, if you put me in a group with so-and-so, I'm not coming. I'm not coming. I, don't, I can't stand to be in the same room with them. I'll come to church with them, but I'm not going to be in a family life group with them. And people have this attitude that they're free to do that, that they have the right and the license to treat children of God with that attitude. And it undermines fellowship. Look at Acts chapter 2, verse 45. They began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. As we read through the rest of the book of Acts, as we read through the epistles, we see that the different churches that were planted around the world did not live in communes. They did not live with only one centralized location of physical possessions that was overseen by a group of leaders. But what's being taught here is the attitude of sharing, the attitude of prioritizing the needs of other people. So you're independent. You can do it yourself. You don't need other people. But what about what they need? Is God calling you to follow Jesus just to bless you? Or does He want to use you to bless other people? There's a pretty clear answer, right? And that's what they pictured. That's what they exemplified in Jerusalem in Acts 2 and 4 and so on. It's the essence of love. It's the thing that calls us to be above anything the world has ever seen before the time of Christ. It's the new commandment, the thing that had never been heard before, the most revolutionary teaching of Christ. 
John chapter 13, verse 34. Jesus says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Not as you want them to love you. Not do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That you love one another, even as I have loved you. That you also love one another. The highest, most selfless, most sacrificial love that ever existed in the annals of mankind. The love of Christ. Verse 35, by this all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. I have seen examples where congregations talked about merging, where they talked about, you know, two smaller congregations. We're going to come together and form one larger congregation. We'll have more resources, more talent pool, more opportunities, reinvigoration. I've seen very few of them be successful. I've seen it mentioned and brought up several times, and I have heard a lot of the arguments as to why it shouldn't be done. One of my least favorite was about stained glass windows. We've had these stained glass windows for 75 years, and you want us to move out of this building? 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 5, talks about people who suppose godliness is a means of gain. 3 John talks about Diotrephes, who loves to be first and refuses to accept those we sent and even put others out of the church. Power structure. My position. What would this do to my influence? What would this do to my place in this body if it changed? You see, it's a focus on self. It's a focus on me and a failure to focus on others. It's a selfishness that sometimes holds back fellowship, sometimes gets in the way of carrying out God's plan. Another gigantic issue that we face in fellowship is modern schedules. Um, Is anybody here not busy? Is anybody here going to be sitting on their couch watching TV every day this week? I doubted it. And if you are, it's probably because you're sick. It's probably because you just had surgery, right? We are extremely busy. And that, to me, that's been one of the biggest blessings of COVID-19 is that I got to spend a lot more time at home. I got to spend a lot more time with my family, but that has changed again. And, you know, my children had a much slower schedule, not nearly as many places to be. And there's been several days where we literally were supposed to be in three different places at the same time. We drop one off and then take the other one here and then the other one's taking that one there. And sometimes it's that way two and three or four days a week. And it gets worse and worse and worse. Anytime I'm thinking about a men's day, a men's fellowship, I'm thinking about talking to people who are willing to give up a Saturday morning and come and talk about the Bible and talk about spiritual things. I know I'm talking to leaders. I know I'm talking to people who are interested and engaged and want to do better. And so let me say this specifically to you as a leader, as your role as the head of a household, as your role as the head of a relationship, in your role as an influencer in your congregation, or maybe a leader, an elder, a deacon, a preacher, a Bible class teacher, whatever your role, even if you have no title, You have influence where you are. And almost every person above the age of about five has some relationship where they even have a leadership role. We need to lead people away from worldly values because that overemphasis on the pursuits and the achievements of the world leads thousands of our brothers away from fellowship. You remember the parable of the soils where Jesus talks about the farmer who went out and cast his seed and some fell over there on the pavement or over, and some fell over here on the rocks and then some fell over there in the, in the bushes and in the thorns and then some fell out here in the good ground. 
Well, you remember what he said, the thorns were. This is one of the few parables where Jesus gave us the explanation, and he explained what he's picturing by the seed that fell among the thorns. Matthew chapter 13, verse 22, he says, The worries of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. How many of our brothers and sisters, but quite frankly, especially brothers, stay away from fellowship of the church, stay away from relationships that they need to be building in the church, from the pursuit of career and status and money? It's a high percentage. For the ones that stay away, that's one of the main reasons. The worries of the world. And trying to get your child that athletic scholarship to college is sometimes way more important than the fellowship of the church. The worries of the world. That's what Jesus said. And you know what it'll do? It'll choke it out. When it becomes a secondary priority, that higher priority is in the control of the prince of this world, and he's going to choke it out. And we as leaders need to be exemplifying and encouraging people to look at their lives and look at their schedules with spiritual priorities because it is a, fan, it is a huge temptation. But as leaders, we also need to understand that some restraints on our time are unavoidable and that we have to adjust and we have to help people who are living in a modern world access the blessings of the kingdom of Christ. And so we have to make those blessings as accessible as it is in our power to make them. And so sometimes we can be held back by what worked in the past, but doesn't work now. And by things that we used to do, confusing man-made tradition and expedience with the, with the truth of Scripture. You know, in the first century, there have been several studies done, and one of the most trustworthy that I've seen only looked at the nation of Italy. But in the nation of Italy, 35 to 40 percent of the population were slaves. They didn't control their own time. They didn't control their own uh, schedules. And the restrictions on what they could do and where they could go were extreme. But there's quite a bit of evidence that a lot of the members of the church in the first century were slaves. And we have quite a bit of instructions in the, the epistles about slaves. Philemon, almost exclusively about slave, about a slave. And is mentioned in several other epistles. The church was able to accommodate the restrictions on those schedules. And so must we. If you think about the different, um, the different times and ways the church met, Acts chapter 2, they're meeting on the day of Pentecost, and you remember the first thing that Peter said in Acts chapter 2, he says, men and brethren, you know they're not drunk because it's only the third hour of the day. It's 9 o'clock in the morning. And that's a Sunday. The day of Pentecost is a Sunday, 50 days after Passover, or after the last uh, the seventh Sabbath after Passover. So Pentecost is always on a Sunday. First meeting, maybe you could go back to the resurrection, the week after the resurrection. But when the church definitely is in existence and exploding, begins to explode, Acts chapter 2, meeting of the church on Sunday, and they were there before 9 o'clock in the morning. There's already a crowd gathered by 9 o'clock. In Acts chapter 3, they're meeting in Solomon's portico. Acts chapter 20, when Paul was in Troas, they're meeting. They meet together to break bread, and Paul continues his discourse until midnight. And so I hope I'm on safe ground in saying they started meeting later in the day. They probably weren't meeting early in the morning, and he went until midnight. You see, there's a different time schedule. We also have a meeting in the temple. We have a meeting in houses. Acts chapter 4, they're meeting in a woman's house privately, not for worship, but for prayer. And then we have examples of them meeting in other people's uh, in other people's houses. We have them um, in Acts chapter 18. They meet in a house of 
Titius Justus, whose house was next to the synagogue, Acts chapter 19. Paul moves to the school of Tyrannus. Um, what I'm saying is there's leeway in scheduling. And so church leaders need to adjust to make it easy for people to enjoy and be drawn in by the fellowship of the church and not make fellowship a rigid, it must be like this and you must conform. That's not how it worked in the New Testament. And it's not how it works in the modern age because when you do that, too many people leave. Too many people choose a different path. We must lead our followers to connections with other Christians. Going back to Acts chapter 2, finally, we have, I think what I see and what I have experienced, I, I speak from personal experience, is it feels awkward to have people into our homes and mix social with spiritual. It feels, and for some people, they never have anybody to their home ever, and if somebody comes and knocks on their door unannounced, it's really offensive. That's a thing that's changed in my lifetime. But when we first did this, when we had people into our home and we said, we're going to you know, play cards, we're going to play board games, but first we're going to sing a few songs and we're going to have prayer. And we're like, oh, I've never done this before. But look at Acts chapter 2 again, verse 42. Devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. You see, there's no distinction between apostles' teaching and fellowship or prayer or breaking bread. Breaking bread refer to the Lord's Supper. Does breaking bread refer to common meals? Both. Depending on the context, sometimes it's, it means exclusively Lord's Supper. Sometimes it doesn't. But they're eating together. And you see that in verse 46. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple, breaking bread from house to house. Day by day, House to house, they're breaking bread. That's common meal. Taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart. And so they've got prayer and apostles' teaching mixed with food and table fellowship. They mix the social with the spiritual. And I'll tell you right now, this is a fantastic way to build spiritual relationships. And it's a fantastic way to evangelize. And Brother Farr talked about it very eloquently about the power of eating together. There is an intimacy and a friendship that is created in eating together. And you see this in the scriptures over and over. Um, the Lord's Supper was instituted at a common meal. The day of resurrection, when Jesus appeared to him in the upper room, he, he ate a piece of fish. You know the implication of that. They had fish. They were eating together. Uh, sea of Galilee, he cooks fish for them. Acts chapter 20, after Eutychus is raised, they break bread. The church eats together as fellowship. And I'll, I'll tell you right now, and I don't, I don't want to be offensive and I, I don't want to state this offensively, but there's way more argument in favor of the, of the church eating inside the church building than there is to own a church building. There's way more authority for eating in the church building than owning the church building. And I'm not against owning church buildings. I, I'm grateful that we have this wonderful property and that we're putting it to spiritual use. But part of the church is fellowship. We need to understand that. We need to teach that and model that. We have to overcome our selfishness. We have to adjust to modern schedules. And we have to mix the social with the spiritual. God bless you.